Hey, welcome to Dollar Views. I'm Brian Gillis. And I'm Stephen Maltmanex. We're just a couple of Long Beach State film grads with a lifelong passion for cinema trying to put our money where our mouths are. And we decided to make our BAs mean something by offering our spoiler-free take on the latest film releases. Plus, any other media we've ingested over the past week. Whether that's the latest Buzzworthy show, an album that's been on constant rotation, that indie darling no one can shut up about, a cute romantic comedy, or the latest Michael Bay masterpiece. We go over it all. One dollar. At a time. Welcome to Alpha. The city of a thousand planets. Where for hundreds of years, every species has shared their knowledge and their intelligence with each other. It's paradise. Amazing. After centuries of peace and prosperity, an unknown force wants to destroy all we have created. Agents Valerian and Laureline, you have less than 10 hours to find the threat and eliminate it. How to get it to work. So this is going to be a lot shorter episode than last week. Don't expect triple features in the near future. That was both a lot of money to watch and a lot of time to talk. And edit um, and put up yeah, episodes and, and, late. And, Everything, yeah, that was that was a hassle. Uh, this week we only got two, which is still two more than we usually do. Yeah, it's not the first time we're doing it. No, not definitely not the first, not the last either, because, hey, good things usually come out around the same time, especially in the summer. We led into this first movie for two weeks. We did Nikita or the Flem Nikita on Death of Cinema, and then we followed that up with Leon or Leon the Professional, two of his early films, two of his bigger films, especially in terms of creating his, his just everything outside of you know like the things that he produced like the transporter taken or even the more artsy fartsy stuff like fifth element you saw this one in 3d of course right duh duh okay just checking i'm sorry but just if you are gonna be like one of the few americans that go see this in theaters motherfucker why would you not like i it would be a waste well, of a i ticket. was very lucky i didn't even buy this ticket i bought the the cinerama ticket i got for dunkirk instead but yeah, you know, I, I didn't really have to stress it because me and Ashley go and see 3D a lot because, hey, she's dating me. And most of the time that we've seen something in 3D, they've shown the 3D trailer for this. I don't know if mm-hmm. we they did one for Spider-Man. Definitely was one for Captain America, I think it were. Or not Captain America, Captain Underpants. Pretty much uh, maybe Planet of the Apes. I'm not sure. But they've been showing a 3D trailer for this one for a long, long time. Like since the beginning of the year. Maybe even Logan had a trailer, even though I didn't see that in 3D because, hey, it wasn't available at least on this no. country. Um, but I've known since then, like, this looks really good. Is that post-converted? I can't tell. Please be amazing. And it, it pays off. The 3D is magnificent. You do get a thousand planets. You get beaches and mountains and streams, underwater. You get stuff in space. A crap ton it, like, of alien species. Like, oh, just, yeah. Like, this feels almost like a um, Guillermo del Toro movie in terms of <laughs> how many creatures are on screen all at once. And I, I also mentioned this in the the Leon episode, but this this seems straight up like it's definitely part of the Luc Besson like filmic sim, like cinematic universe or whatever, because this is very much so. If you took the Fifth Element and you pushed it forward two hundred years or even just a hundred years, that you would get to this kind of alien like superstructure in space. Mm-hmm. In terms of the flying cars and the weird people. And I also got shades of men in black in this film, especially the the three um, gossipers who kind of were like reminiscent of the, the aliens. Oh, yeah, Day, yeah, the, uh, the, the little, the worm guys. Yeah, yeah, the worm guys, like uh, like 100% worm guys. These alien creatures, man, they're, they're a lot of fun, especially those gossipers. Um, mm-hmm. There's a lot of, um, <laughs> it's such a simple, like kind of dumb face, but I, I don't know which ones they are, but like at that one level where, you know, they're forbidden to go to and, yeah, there's the, just that the, one alien uh, forcing uh, the natives. Yeah, just forcing that girl to try on the dress and just kept going like, it's, like it's it's just <laughs> it's so fucking funny, man. I, it's so I, international. The smile on my face throughout this, it was just pure joy. Really, I mean, this thing is a fucking roller coaster ride. Like, it is a theme park of a movie. It really is. This In my is... brief paragraph I put on Letterbox, it's like uh-huh. enjoy you know the what? ride, turn yeah, your brain just, off, just grab it. the popcorn. I mean, seriously, like right when you meet Dane DeHaan, 
all he has is a conversation about how awesome he is and I'm like perfect. all the stats that he has. Don't you want to marry like, me? Let's speak exposition. <laughs> I'm I'm good. He never fucking proves that he's a badass for one second. We just no. know that he is because he has that when he, he holds a the cool way he gun talks. in like the first action sequence. Well, like, it's like I I know you're a big champion for a cure for wellness, uh-huh. but this film for the first time, especially since Chronicle, I felt that Dane DeHaan is like an underrated just actor that he does have the charisma that he could be a star and instead you know he was cast in a couple things that kind of ruined things for him like being in amazing spider-man 2 he, uh, yeah, just he's not the best uh not the best uh harry osborne or green goblin for that matter. definitely I mean, not you know he's having fun here oh yeah like, it's not like the material is challenging anybody but no. yeah i mean it's not like um i got like um, almost I, I, a young keanu reeves from him the way that he kind of just <laughs> exudes coolness without trying. Like, it literally looks like he jumped out of bed on set. Like, his hair is not too good. His clothing is not too fashionable. Like, it's torn up or whatever. Like, he might get, I mean, like, that action. They even comment action. on that. Like, why do you look like a tourist that just got out of yeah. it's like, well, we're, that, what That's where we're going. Yeah, we're supposed that's to be mission. tourists, yeah. you know? Like, everything about him in this film, it's like, oh, yeah. Like, I totally buy him as this comic, like, super cop that can do nothing wrong. You know, like, the film is called Valerian and the Plan- the 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 planet of a thousand worlds or whatever um city of a thousand planets but it could just be called valerian like it's about him like it's just oh yeah here's here's this thing that they're doing they have an arc but i'll be so surprised if this doesn't get a franchise at least just like in china if it does well enough because yeah. you, you can't i know you didn't see triple x uh, the return of xander cage yet but uh chris Wu. That Asian guy in that film is also the Asian guy in this one. The one that's just like placed in the space station. He his like mm-hmm. I watched the featurette on him on the Triple X DVD or Blu-ray, and it's like he's like one of the bigger Chinese or like Hong Kong pop stars who's just now crossing over to films, and he's been in two pretty big American blockbusters this year alone. I have a feeling like he's gonna be in more and more, even if he doesn't have the best screen presence or. Or dialogue like you might well you know, i hope up. that this makes money in china because oh it definitely made money in it china. deserves it it's definitely going to make money in france because uh-huh. i don't even know if it's out there yet right now but i know they're looking forward to it i mean yeah you know just hey it's a it's a shame it's not doing well here but man it, like it, it was fun like just you know right i know that you love the vr action sequence uh-huh. right from the beginning because well, that's basically what it is we ha- well like right when they- i was seeing that i was like no this is totally up your alley like you are going to love this the origin scene is vr when they're on the beach that's like room scale mm-hmm. vr ashley and i had a conversation about the, what you're talking about when they're in like i don't even know what to call it the the marketplace yeah i was under the impression that it was virtual reality no no no, no. she was um it which is one of us and was it, it's, about it, it is and they're crossing it with um, no okay no no i travel exactly so like that was her she was talking about it being interdimensional uh, marketplace and i'm like no it's virtual reality but yeah i agree with you they use virtual reality as a means to get through the dimension so it's not confusing but yeah how that whole sequence is handled the fact that it's opened with that well not opened open but like that's where you get a feel for the characters in the world and what's possible here the way that that sets up everything before you actually go to this city before you get really confused on what's going on before it becomes like a almost like a political thriller yeah Um, which has a good message behind it but i mean you know like eh, really it's it's just this world and the tools in this world like i mean this is the future though like there's the future future. i mean when you get to that thriller it's like okay i i get the message there you know like it it works well enough. I guess it's nice seeing Clive Owen in something because really, where the fuck has he been? But like, he's been getting I mean, yeah, old. Yeah. You know, you're in that marketplace and you just you're in awe of like every detail, this world out. Everything is just like it. It feels like the future, like years mm-hmm. down the line. Like this is like a fucking. I'm sorry, just like my inner eight year old was just fucking losing it, like almost every second at every single detail here. Like those fucking uh, what, like those butterflies, like that are in the spaceship, and then like how that turns out to be something else. It's like, man, this thing is a trip. There's a lot of fun to be had here. Like this is so much fun. Like it's very evident that this is a franchise, like a comic book that he loved growing up. Uh, much in the same way, you know, with Leon or The Fifth Element, where he wrote these stories from a young age, and he definitely had an idea where it wanted to go, and he was able to make get the money to make it and bring his vision to screen. Like it's you, you can like just feel him be that ten year old self 
flipping the pages of this I comic know, book. Like, it's like that. Like, it might be a bit too long, but that 10-year-old is just like, I don't care. I just want to put it all it's, in there. It's like, only long because they have to give, you know, a, a firm introduction to not mm-hmm. this world, which... That int- like the literal opening sequence. Oh the yeah, David the, the major Tom video. opening, so good. It was like, good, but like it was great, long. Like, it was the full song. It was like five minutes was. long. It was, but like, like still, I okay, love how now that worked. It's, it's like okay, old footage, and then we just keep seeing it grow and grow, and like it, it was just so fucking cool. Like just to see Luke Besson take his time actually to open something like but that. It's, and it's reasons like those that this isn't tracking well, at least in this country, because this is, you know, it's once again, it's cinema du look like this uh-huh. is look what I can do. Look what I can did. Look what I put on film. Well, and also, I mean, you know, the marketing campaign really is not that strong. Like I had no idea what this was about, even based off the trailer. I was just kind of like, I think Oh, is it's a good thing. It's called Valerian. And there's all these cool, this cool looking shit. And yeah, it's I, like, I, I saw that. And really my main thing was like, Avatar aliens. Yeah, and I was just like, okay, I know this is Lupuson, and it looks like it's going to be sick in 3D. That's why I went, you know. That's like, why I if, think anyone that went If it didn't went, have went. those incentives, then it might have just looked like a shit show to me, for all I know. But yeah, this was not something that was marketed well to the masses. Like, I don't think it's really clear what this movie is, and really, like, the plot for this is just kind of blah. It's just... It's not it's, a movie. It's kind of like a video sh- game moving from the next level to the next level, yeah. and it's just nonstop action. Like we're not going to probably say... Well, I, I'm, I know we don't do spoilers, but we're probably not going to say anything about the story here. I don't want to really spoil it. I'll just say, well, you know There's what, also I, really nothing to share. Like, there's not... Well, it doesn't I'll, I'll say question this. things. I like Rihanna's appearance. Um, oh, I, I yeah. like what Ethan Hawke did, even if that, it was well, crazy. Sh- it's but, a yeah. shared appearance. Like, that, I know, I know, that yeah. scene right there... It's going to end up on YouTube, and people are going to watch the movie because of that scene. Like, that scene alone, I knew Rihanna was in it. Like, I'd seen, like, moments of her performance in the trailers. But the way that thing plays out, when they're in that red light district, and just everything about Ethan Hawke, who's, like, literally the only major, major star in this film. Because, like, you have Clive Owen, you know, you have Dane DeHaan, you have uh, Cara Delvin, uh, you know, you have these people that are kind of climbing the charts or past their prime but like Rihanna and Ethan Hawke literally like th- that tandem that duo how they work together and especially in that sequence is like that's probably what they filmed and sold to investors well I don't know a lot of it's independently financed too and I think some of it is crowdsourced but um, maybe but I want to see yeah. just that scene again in 3D <laughs> you know what like, I will we say talked this, about it like I want to go back to the cinema walk into the house right around that time I'll be like oh is it like an hour and 30 minutes in okay time to step into the theater and just watch that amazing burlesque show not even just because of the burlesque, but the music, the way Ethan Hawke is, like, fucking biting the scenery with that nose ring that's dangling from his mouth to his nose. Mm-hmm. Like, everything about it. Like, just, uh, like, just fantastic filmmaking. Yeah, Fun I will say this, though. I mean, I miss John Renault. Like, I thought about this afterward just because a lot of people are shitting on Ethan Hawke. And I'm like, fuck it. You know, he's, he's having fun. Just, oh, what the fuck's mm-hmm. he doing? It's like, I don't care. But I did think about this after Leon, and I was just like... You know, I would trade Ethan Hawke in that role for Jean Reno instead. Or Gary Oldman. Gary Oldman for Clive Owen. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Clive Owen but, was um, just miscast. He truly was. He didn't. He doesn't yeah, really it's, it's imbue like, that kind of character ever. I don't really buy him as that type of guy. Like yeah. he can be a mean guy, but you know, not not like that. Just not like that. But Gary yeah, Oldman? I miss seeing Clive Owen, hey. man. Like, but yeah, I, there there's some fun stuff here. Even if you know the the second lead is a supermodel. Who's in more and more films? <laughs> not the best in Suicide Squad. Not the best in a couple. Hey, but other you things. loved her in Paper she Towns. Has, she, she's not in Paper Towns. Like, okay, she plays no, a she's character. She's the girl in Paper Towns. Yeah, she plays she? a character, but she has almost no screen presence. the 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 film is about what happened to her. Where is she? She maybe, maybe, maybe gets fifteen to twenty minutes of screen time. She's not in it, and that's why Probably it's like more her, than that. That's why it's her first film, though. Like, it, or like first big film. Like, she's. It's not about her. She's the MacGuffin. Okay, she's the one that that's puts the mystery in there. She looks good. She's not a bad actress. But I don't think you know she really hasn't had that much to do, especially here. Like this is not an she acting has, showcase. Like a, she has I, a I lot think you to do here, though. Like you she really seem, does. Yeah, like but you know I, I think you're kinder to or you're giving Dane DeHaan more attention here than I would. He's, I mean, for me, this the is the one Lucas on going nuts oh, yes. with playing with every single toy at his disposal. It's that kind of show, and Dane DeHaan and film, just the actors are just a prop for that to me. 
a film isn't just about what it shows or what it gives you. It's also about who's in it. Mm-hmm. Like that's always yeah. been true for not just cinema, but for music or, oh, yeah. or no, any no, kind no, of artistry absolutely. outside it's, of It's a, not to diminish what sculpture. they're doing. It's just that, mm-hmm. you know, I, I don't but think they I got personally to do think much. Dane DeHaan is really good in this. Like I like not like an amazing actor or anything, but just like I said, the cool that he imbues. Like you believe that he is this international not international, but fucking space cadet that he can literally like save a planet or such well it's also you know i i this is something actually i really like about it or at least of how mm -hmm. i presume that this world works is that these are not teens that are fucking buff or tough or anything they they have to think quickly on their feet i think that's where we're getting to more and more now where it's just it's more about you know how things are happening so fast that you have to quickly react and those are going to be the type of people that are like that are thrown into situations more like this, you know, not like the eighties macho tough guy, like Sly he did that or fucking thing where he took that, like you thought it was like a breathing vent or something before he got jizzed on by that blue stuff. <laughs> yeah. And then you're like, Oh wait, no, this is something completely different. And in that moment, I was like, Oh, that was so cool. Like almost, almost a James Bond thing. Like imagine a Luke Besson, James Bond film set in Paris. Oh, I mean, there's always just this great, like j- just sense of discovery that fucking star Wars has that I love, mm-hmm. um, you know, where you're all, you're just seeing like, things that clearly belong in that world that work in that world but it's why people you look like at them sci-fi. for the first time and it's like wow you know that works it's like but... sci-fi is one of those things where literally anything is possible and if if it's filmed well enough it's like oh this could happen you know like it, it, it stops being a possibility and more of a plausibility like could that actually happen and when you're watching this you feel that you're like yeah like i said like kind of like a guillermo del toro film especially something like hellboy where you go mm-hmm. this might be weird uh you know mythology and these people don't look like anything i've ever seen before but they're still not necessarily human but yeah like they have the emotions that I have. Like they are fleshed out and you understand their viewpoints. Like the, 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 whatchamacallit, the Mexican standoff in this film that happens towards the beginning, just the way that's handled, like the way it's switching between like the three different uh, ways of seeing that sequence. Real interesting. Like you, like, I understand, like, in the the couple of reviews I read about this, where, they're like, it starts off really strong, and it turns into shit. I'm like, I don't see that. I think it's to always... To some extent, to, like, I kind it, of it agree it with it, though. It slows like, down. I, you know, it doesn't turn to shit, but I do think that this movie is at its peak very, very early, and it doesn't stay strong throughout. It doesn't, it doesn't lose me, but, I mean, you know, the best things that happen are early on, and then it's just kind mm-hmm. of a slow decline down where... You know, there there's a certain point where it's just like, well, I'm 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 tempted to look at my watch or turn on my phone to see what time it is. But I mean, yeah, just all those early action sequences are like the strongest things in the movie. And then afterwards, when it's resolving this plot that you don't care that much about, nope. it just it goes down a little bit for me. Like, but that's not is... really a complaint. It's not like I was lost. It's just it's never as awesome as it was when it started. Like this is firmly a dime a dozen film. But as a theatrical experience in 3D, it's a buy. It's for that. such a fucking buy. Like they don't do 3D like this anymore. Even if this was post conversion, as someone who watches 3D always nowadays, Guardians one, Guardians two, fucking Spider Man. Like if it's a Marvel or DC film, I'm probably gonna see it in 3D. And Wonder Woman didn't do stuff like this. Like Wonder Woman, mind you, was fine in 3D. Plan the Apes was great in 3D. Um, but like. Captain Underpants, there was a reason to see it. They did a couple of good, really good gags in 3D with that film. But outside of that, this is by far the best 3D film I've seen in quite some time. Like, it really does just put you into the action. You believe this world more so because it has an extra layer of depth to it. I, maybe I would have liked if there was some pop out because, hey, they never do that for some reason. But at the it was s- quite a bit throughout this. I, that, not that I caught. Like, it, like I, I'm talking about like really? in my face, like- in my face. Like, when you watched Avatar for the first right time, when they leave the... and that fucking flower literally went right in front of your face. Yeah, there was a moment like that. I didn't catch in it. In this. All right, it's right at the end of the first action sequence, right when, well, semi-spoilers, but right when their ship takes off and they have the dog that, like, is coming right for the camera and then falls back down. I, it didn't, you didn't get that? I, I didn't really get Maybe my uh, my projector wasn't as good as yours, I'm not sure. Must have. Yeah, no, I, I got that effect, and it was fun. But, yeah, um... I mean, this is post Avatar like 3D mm-hmm. filmmaking done right. Fucking really right. Lupusan was waiting years to make this. It really was Avatar that he's on record oh, yeah. for saying, "Hey, now I know it's possible. Definitely. Now I'm going to do it." Like, like I said, and... the, the aliens here, the main alien species that's pivotal to the story, 
without mm-hmm. a doubt look like the Avatar aliens probably Just on purpose. they're blue. Well, also That's because racist. this is Weta and ILM and a, like a thousand other production companies that worked on it. But not just because they're blue, because they literally look like the Avatar aliens, like to a T. They That's still, racist. They don't have the no, hair they don't. Pussies, they don't okay? have ponytails. Yeah, they're they not really. They don't have the hair dick. That pussies. humanoid. But outside of that, no, like the, the, even their world. None of them almost, sound like dudes either. They all they all sound like women because it's French. Yeah, but the, it's exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's a dime. It's a dime. Unless you love 3D, if you love 3D, please see it. One of the better theatrical 3D experiences you can have, hopefully this year, but definitely this summer. What has happened is a colossal military disaster. We shall go on to the end. We shall never surrender. The other film that we both saw is, you know, by a filmmaker who kind of proclaimed alongside James Cameron this past decade or so that the theater is worth going to. And that, of course, is Christopher Nolan. And we are going to talk about Dunkirk, which I assume you saw in 70 millimeter. Naturally. Did you do IMAX 70? No, 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 I, I did not. We just have standard 70, which I am actually cool with because I don't mind IMAX aspect ratio switches. But this movie just like looks like an old-fashioned just like 70 millimeter widescreen epic that that's how i wanted to see it honestly Mm -hmm. even if parts of the image is missing i just i wanted that wide anamorphic look that just harkened back to i had you know cinema for me i had nothing you know when you go to the cinerama dome and you see anything on the screen that big and curved you don't miss a thing and especially when it's well you were technically missing some top and bottom uh, well, not much, shots, okay? But, yeah. but it, I know. See, it's the same with me, though. I was like, I I just wanted a wide image for that. It was very wide. We were on the top deck, and it still was a magnificent Oh, yeah, screen. no, that theater, that's a fucking great theater. So what the hell made it your worst viewing experience ever, Brian? So I went on, what day was that? I think it was last Monday. A friend of mine who just had a baby boy, congrats, Nestor, um, invited me on a whimsy. I was at Ashley's place. We just got back from Santa Monica. We were already talking about seeing Valerian the next day, which we went this past Tuesday. And he texted me like when I was driving back from Santa Monica with her family. And I was, he was like, hey, you want to see Dunkirk tonight? It's in Ramadome, 1130. And I was like, I asked her about it. She said yes. We said yes. We went. When we got into the theater... It was already kind of weird. Like, not the theater theater, but the lobby. Because there was, like, a task force of police. Like, literally, like, four officers walking through the lobby of the Arclight Cinema. I was like, what the fuck is going on here? That passed by didn't matter. We get into the actual Cinerama Dome. We get our seats. We take them. We're eating our fancy hot dogs and pretzels with, uh, you know, filled with nacho cheese and and, and beer and whatnot. You know, doing the, the premier cinematic experience. Not in just Hollywood, but arguably in the world. And, um... There were a lot of high teens, low 20s in the crowd that were clearly drinking a lot. You know, like I said, it's like 1130 on a Monday. It's summer or whatever. They are probably actors or aspiring actors or whatever models. And at first, you know, there was this loud group that was doing all kinds of shit. I was like, oh, I'm going to get someone kicked out tonight. Like, it just seemed like that. Um, where they, some of them literally walked all the way down to the front and were like doing like cheerleading, like try, give me a D, D, and I like it was kind of funny, but I was like not, not here, not now, not here, not now, not this movie. Uh, but they weren't actually the ones that were the issue. The actual issue came from two other people that were of the similar age group. There were two kids, two rows in front of me to the left that were texting. Throughout the first 10 minutes, not like, oh, take out my phone, look at it, like texting, phone away, texting, phone away, texting, phone away, where at first I took a napkin and threw it out one of their heads. They took that napkin and threw it in front of them and kept on texting. I very quickly ran out to the lobby, like literally ran to the lobby, told them two seats ahead of me, two people to the left, they're texting. They've already done it twice. Someone comes, pats them on the back, tells them, don't do that. Then they keep on texting there's other people that are doing it. They get warnings too. Even one of them gets called out into the lobby and they have a talking to, and then no one got kicked out. No one on the phone. I wasn't even the only person. There was two other people that I know of that left to tell them, Hey, can you please talk to these people? Can you please kick these people out? And that didn't happen, which was beyond a surprise to me. Instead, one of them 
walked like four rows back with a girl and then started actually talking through the movie, which is even worse than being on your phone. Because at least if you're on your phone, like, you know, I'm like glancing over to the side. But when you're having a conversation, you're really disrespecting not just the film, but the filmmaking and especially a literal church of motion pictures. Um, it was, to say the least, one of the worst cinematic experiences I've ever had. I was very... They did not take care of it at all. No one got kicked out. And at the end of the, the screening, you know, it wasn't so bad. And part of that had to do, and we'll talk about this in a second here, that is a tense film. So being in a tense environment during a tense film makes <laughs> things worse, especially when you have this score that's, like, super over the fucking top. Really, you know, I, I, I got to take someone where there's four of us, and all, all three of them besides me had never been in the dome before. And, you know, I'm telling them, oh, yeah, like, this is a great place. You're going to see why. Like, I shared history on the dome and, and all kinds mm-hmm. of different things. And, no, it didn't matter. It was still just as bad, if not worse, than the theatrical experiences that I've had almost every single time I've gone to the movies since this podcast that began. That is just fucking People are always on their phone. People are always talking. People are always doing things. It always happens. There were people putting their feet up on the chairs in the dome, like, it was upsetting. Like, I don't want to go to the cinema anymore. The only reason I do is for a premiere 3D experience to see something before I can at home or because I really want the filmmaker to get the, the box office results, this one being all three of those things. And even still, like, yeah, like, it it was beyond bad. I mean, it's still uh, the fucking dome. Really, they got to do that there, yeah. just because they didn't care. They wanted to see the new Batman director's movie in the fancy version with their beer because they had the money to buy it in the fancy theater. They didn't care. Did you not shush them several times? At I least? didn't have to shush them. I literally threw things at them. The gentleman who complained after me, when he came back to mm-hmm. his seat before he sat down, he like very physically pointed at the person that was talking and said it's them and they still didn't get kicked out let's talk about the movie Christopher Nolan World War II mm-hmm. Dunkirk I don't really have anything to say I mean I I. it's good it's a really it's okay it, it's a really good uh, theatrical experience unless you have Brian's um, which yeah yeah sorry that fucking it's a blows, good theatrical man. experience but like the movie movie it's okay I mean, see, this is kind of where I was when, like, you know, the trailer came out and people were getting pumped for it. I'm just like, yeah, it's, it's another it was, World it was War II good movie. Marketing. But yeah, I. I but well, it's not a World War II movie, not really. Oh, well, it, yeah, it is a World War II movie. It's it's a film that World takes War place II. during World War II. That's a but World War II movie. More, s- sorta, okay. It, it's a World it, War II movie before America goes in, where everyone's still getting their asses kicked. You know, the turning point has not it, happened yet. Like it was, but the a stakes loss. are so small. The scope is so limited. Like, it is an epic film. Just mm-hmm. the amount of people that you have on screen at once. The ships, the fucking boats, the cars. Well, there's not a lot of cars. The wardrobe. Like, it's tons of people. Like, there's hundreds of people on screen at once, which is mm-hmm. something that doesn't happen anymore. Not even in superhero films. Oh, yeah. The fact that I mean, Warner Nolan Brothers has gave earned Christopher that right Nolan. Now, where, like, he will, mm-hmm. you know, like, this is, I think this is the best way I can describe him as a filmmaker, because I also rewatch parts of Interstellar um, after this on Blu-ray, and Man, like, it's been a couple of years since I've watched that movie, but holy shit, there is still nothing that looks like it. Like, it is just... It it is just amazing to look at and really like the way that Nolan like as far as a filmmaker now like you know he's just ambitious as hell and does not want to waste the audience's time like is always going to give them just something interesting to look at something to see and you know this is a survival story it's a pretty damn good one it's it's nice it's tense and you know, I mean, I don't it's, think the score is over the top. It's just, it's very minimal and it constantly is. has that ticking clock just going on to amp up the tension because it's not crazy cuts that are happening. It's all really the score and just the performances that are building that up. But uh, yeah, See, I mean, cuts that's. are kind of crazy, though. I-, I know, like, a lot of detractors are out there talking about the split narrative structure and that's something he does reason. though he's always done that he doesn't go linear and i thought it was an interesting choice not like well there's a difference between christopher nolan doing linear and no this film is linear very much so no, no 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 it's just it's i mean not a singular timeline but it is linear you know that you have separate timeline yeah mole, like but then you realize you have the mole two weeks you have the the pilot two hours and then you have one week the, the, one day the boat, one hour one day 
Yeah, and they're they're told linearly. They don't jump each story. Around. Yeah, but then you know it's but then it's like they're happening at different it, times though. And then once you go to a different one, you see that characters were at that different space than they are then. So. You know, he does play a lot with narrative structure and time and just your understanding of just, you know, I mean, I mean, like, this is one of those things that will be examined in film school that in, you know, you basically can manipulate time and space through editing. Like, I'm sure this will be used as an example because it's an obvious one. I don't think so. It's it's not a good one, though. Like from the filmmaker of following a memento, which are literal nonlinear storytelling where editing is at a value Whereas this kind of feels like almost reality TV, where it shows you something, uh, you get a commercial break, and then it comes back from the commercial break, it shows you the same thing again, and then it shows you what happens next, and then it does it again. I mean, like, he, it still, doesn't, he doesn't do, like, unless it's insomnia, he's still not doing a straightforward, like, narrative, like, 100%, you know? All he's the still, Batman films. He's playing, yeah, no... Even um, okay, okay. Well, Dark Knight, linear. Dark Knight, and Dark Knight Rises. Yes, Batman Begins. No, like part of what was new at that time well, was because there's flashbacks. Yeah, the way that it, it approached the origin story. You know that uh, Man of Steel but, did a uh, similar thing, um, practically the same thing later on. But yeah, but yeah, Batman Begins like took that style straight out of Malick, and he was the first one to do that. It's still not crazy like this film tries to be. Mm. Like I think this is one of those films where just its structure alone wants to make you think. But there's not much to not think really. about. Not really. It's kind of, really just it kind of spoon feeds you. I think it's just trying to give you the ad experience and just that you know, it, I mean, this is a simple movie about survival, and I don't, you know, if I look online for like just a little bit, I'll see things on Wikipedia saying this is Nolan's like best praised movie. You know, like the actors are getting so much credit. Eh. It's like, all right, fine, Nolan what goes actors? for Oscar porn. Sure, I don't, I don't care. You know, like uh, this is how I felt about it for a while. Is like. I He's, didn't care about any of the characters. Here. Yeah, no, th- this is not, like uh, not a one of them. Like this is one of those films where it's like it is. It was the theatrical experience for me. You know, like I am quite satisfied. Like I don't think I'll watch this movie again unless no. it's like I don't no. know twenty years from now and I want to revisit some Nolan. But it's like yeah, as far as I'm concerned, Nolan's made like enough masterpieces to me that's like I'll see anything with his name on it because he's earned that right sure. you know Ridley Scott most has that, that right way. Uh, Steven Spielberg has that right Martin Scorsese has that right it's just like you don't have to wow me anymore just I find your work interesting I will see it and I mean yeah you know this is one of those where hey it's it's a good flick in his filmography that's going to be there when you know for people that like discover his big ones like The Dark Knight or Inception and, or Memento and then they're going to be like or Prestige you know and they're going to be like oh what else has he done Prestige oh hey Prestige. uh y- you know um fucking Dunkirk still, hey that was still good. his best Prestige is still his best always going to be his best he's never going to top it Dark he's Knight not, you can't Dark Knight no it's Dark it's Knight Prestige no Dark Knight no but it's the Dark film Knight. that Dark came Knight. Dark Knight after Dark Knight Dark Knight Dark Knight Dark Knight you're wrong. Sorry, sorry, but like You're that—that wrong. That is one of the greatest movies of all time. And the Prestige is better, Just unquestionably. It's a greater film of all time, for no other reason than you know it has David Bowie in it, and probably his best filmic role. Uh, the Man Who Fell to Earth, I, and I still just because seen that. you said that. And but the Dark Knight's got, a better movie than the Man Who Fell Earth. So, and ergo, Wolverine Dark Knight is a on better screen movie. together. I'm sorry, but you cannot go against the Heath Ledger. Uh, Joker film yeah, with got, the Prestige. You, got you just Hugh can't Hugh Jackman do it. in the Prestige. Yeah, yeah, you do. I'm and sorry, but it's a Dark Knight. Not for me. You will not change my mind here. Uh, Dark Knight is a fucking masterpiece. Doesn't Prestige mean I don't is, love the Prestige. Man, Prestige but, is more yeah. of a masterpiece. But yeah, you, I mean, you know what's cool though? I think just about Dunkirk and Valerian being released. Uh, I can't say day. this weekend now because we're a week late, but. You know, you have the best of two worlds, like, as far as Traditional just different types 2D of cinematic. And yeah, over-the-top well, 3D digital. Well, it's just like, you know, especially with, you got, like, an example of, like, you know, this is how I kind of liken um, film and digital, like, at least how it makes sense in my head, is that mm-hmm. I, I look at film itself as a bit more of just a photographer's medium, and with Dunkirk, you know, he's capturing most or, of this stuff live on set. You know, there are real ships out there. Hotemo. There are real extras out there. Yeah, you know, there are there are real planes flying. It's probably all real except, like, you know, some of the smoke or fire. And, like, yeah, every once in a know, while they, they use VFX. But, I mean, you know, the plane the burning oil. is real. Um, but then, you know, you take something like Valerian, which... It's all fake. You know, you cannot do without digital. And the way that I, I kind of see digital is a bit more of a painter's medium where... 
you know, the filmmaker likes to have control there. You know, they, mm-hmm. they put in, they make choices on exactly what goes in there. Um, you know, not only as far as effects, but, you know, like they mess with, um, they, they mess with the palette on, on, um, on set or in the DI, uh, you know, they add things in a frame, they take things out. It's much more controlled and it feels more like a painterly thing. And you have some of the like best, most hardworking filmmakers out there right now, like putting both of those in their prime, you know, Dunkirk like is fucking technically amazing so is valerian like they're just on very very different levels and you got two fine examples of each one at play in theaters right now that came out on the same weekend and that's really cool it is a special time like this summer despite starting really slow really ramped up like there has been a ton basically starting with wonder woman and Mm -hmm. there's basically a little bit of everything for everyone like maybe fast eight no one really cared for okay well that was april technically it, so. that's when the summer kind of started though like that was the first big yeah, big blockbuster yeah, yeah. this year and you know that might have got okay numbers but no one talked about it it, it wasn't special i haven't seen it i still want to see it but china loved it you know we we talked about this before we started recording like oh what's coming out this next week or what just came out this friday and you know we didn't go like ooh ah like that sounds good let's go see that one even if you are going to go see mm-hmm. um ingrid goes west in detroit but yeah. on the other side of the spectrum, it's like, well, Atomic Blonde looks really good. It's just, well, maybe we won't see it in theaters. Where it's like every week, uh, The Dark Tower, the week after this, it's like, yeah, these look like they're probably going to be good movies, you know? And it, it it's such a relief compared to last summer where it was like, oh, that came out? That one that one was interesting. <laughs> what was there? There like Ghostbusters, Warcraft, about, uh, uh, Suicide right. I mean, Squad. Yes, me about last summer. First thing that came to mind for me is there was Swiss Army Man. Um, oh, the, yeah, the good movies. Yeah, yeah, and, and I'm just kind of like, well, what blockbusters did I love? Like, I liked, I really enjoyed Civil War, Suicide Squad. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, Suicide Squad was like literally the biggest movie last that summer. was a year ago i talked yeah. about that on another episode we just did we just so why did. am i forgetting that yeah, yeah no but um, wow i can't believe that's been a year it's been a good year at the movies like it it started off so strong with logan and everything that's come out basically since then audiences have gone for they've made money they've gotten good reviews with the exception of maybe the emoji movie but you know that's meant for a certain audience that's meant for kids yeah. you know and i'm sure for kids just like the angry birds movie also made by sony pictures yeah, animation it'll make money it's, it's gonna make it money. didn't cost that much to make yeah. it's fine yeah so yeah i i couldn't really care less for dunkirk you know great acting by a lot of different people mark relance uh fucking um i'm looking at him right here tom hardy you got uh what's his name harry styles from What's that One Direction, which actually is not bad, to be honest. I mean, yeah, it's it's a finely made, just, uh, like, classically uh, done war flick, and, you know, just about survival, and it works. Um, it's been a week since I've seen it, though, that my memory is pretty hazy on it already. Like, I... It doesn't I, I like the you. novelty of this experience, and it was more about the technical, but, like, no, is, is it groundbreaking? Is it going to be amazing? No, no. like, if... I mean, it, this probably would have been prime for Oscar season and would have gotten, like, you know, a ton of attention. And Like, it's still probably going to get nominated for Best Cinematography or Best Production just because of the scope of it. Did like, you just say Best Production? Don't you mean Best Picture? Same difference. It we are not in production. 1927, Brian. It, It's the same fucking thing. It really is. Um, Whatever. Like, the picture's not what matters. It's the production that went into it and that's why the producer wins yeah. Uh, yeah, but it's a nicely made film you know? yeah it's like, a it's, it's a fine film I, it's just it's not anything that we haven't seen before it's just not something that we've seen recently like the the production and the scale and the scope of things are really impressive and it is epic but there are epics yeah, still like of a different era which are, are even more epic like even especially when it comes to like a World War Two film, I do think it's kind of cool though, just seeing this filmmaker, you know, trying to kind of challenge himself, yeah, literally uh, swing for the fences. It, you know, he's just going for some different. He's not trying to repeat himself, and that, you know, he's still got his own unique spin in there. Um, so I just, yeah, he he swung, I, he hit. It was not amazing. So what? It's a good movie. I found Silver Dollar a little too much of like a Terrence Malick or Kubrick type style of filmmaking here compared to nolan's past works like i can see the malik one because he's been open about that uh for a long time but i don't see the kubrick one well just in terms of this being style over substance for maybe the first time in his career most of nolan's films are about a human angle it's about the characters it's about 
their their problems and the things that they embrace it, it's always the human at the focal point and then it's also the grand which draws you in especially when you look at you know his three batman movies and then man of steel which he produced mm-hmm. and this one is more so look how grand this is oh yeah there's also like these little humans doing things too because outside of the mark I Ryland don't story that way i didn't really feel anything literally for like any of these characters like Tom Hardy it's, it's, is good, especially as a pilot. Like it's it's great to see him, especially the way his arc ends. But I didn't care about him. I didn't care about his. Friends. I mean, I didn't, I didn't feel didn't... that it was style over substance. It's just that for this story, it's very simple and straightforward. That their only goal is to survive. And I mean, yeah, you know, based on how some of these situations went, I do think you know that there was actually quite a bit going on there to maintain tension it wasn't just based on the style you know a lot of it was from just the fear and panic of these soldiers there's a situation where you know they're they're yeah, literally the, um, the floating ship they're, yeah yeah like they're stuck on the ship and they really ha- they have no idea what's going on and they're worried they're just you know one person suddenly says oh that person's a spy and then just out of fear a bunch of people start ganging up on him you know there's a lot of these situations that are created that really work and are intense and they're very well performed it's just it's a very simple narrative where you know you don't really you're watching the situation unfold and you know who the players are but you do not get to know them it's really a movie about an event rather than but uh, you know something like interstellar which is a father's journey about trying to find like who wants to find a, a home for his kids but is also you know doing a great service for the entire of humanity or inception where it's a father trying to get back to his kids or the prestige which is the same fucking thing or the dark knight which is hey you know like a kid trying to get back bruce to his wayne's parents. trying to do some good and the trying to no, bring kid, goodness kid to the world. trying to get back to his and, parents and batman's not about bringing good it's, it's stopping bad there's there's several things a different to that journey. but, um, but i mean this was about the event i don't think it's thus i don't think the style is intruding over anything but when you get to the end of this event the way it ends with the newspaper clipping and the winston churchill speech and how that plays over you know all of the events that just happen spoilers for real life by the way but yeah sure I think we're fine and, and then even more so than that when you get um what's his name british director captain kenneth Ver- brana yeah when you get kenneth brana in this really peculiar role because he's he's not a powerhouse here he kind of doesn't really do anything he just talks a little bit and you, you know you get that final shot of him on the beach and it's just like It doesn't really articulate how important this Dunkirk excavation or evacuation was in the film. You only see a couple of boats. You really do. You only see maybe like 15 of them. You don't see the hundreds that were there in reality. See, I've heard that complaint before, but it's like I got that sense just by that shot of a bunch of people from the homeland just coming in or from just the soldiers reading those newspaper articles and other people just like banging on the windows just going like hey here's a beer welcome back you made it you know like there was that but i that celebratory sense that everything was going to be okay who is only vaguely familiar with world history and was not aware of this incident or event until i saw it which is true probably for most american film goers because hey we're stupid and we don't study history the way that it should be especially world war 2 not involving americans that there was a way it's been not just for Warner Brothers, but for Christopher Nolan to really nail this event, to show you how important it is to not leave anyone behind, that every life is sacred, to, to prove to you the perils of war and how brutal something can be and how you can lose your humanity. Because you do have that human angle. You get Mark Rylance and his son, you get that boat, and you especially well, that, get I mean, the you Killian, also get Murphy. Killian Murphy. Mm-hmm. Who you see like him you, like at one, at one point, that's the thing about the different um, yeah, you, timelines you get here. Him like, you see before him and after. You, get, you see him as a shell-shocked soldier that's just mm-hmm. like, I, I want to go home. What the fuck are we doing? And then you see him in another scenario where he's like, just hold on, you know, he's being very professional doing his job and he cannot empathize at all with the other soldier yet because he hasn't been experiencing the same thing at that point. I mean, you know, there is there is quite a bit here. Like, there you are these little moments that just show, hey, war is hell and it's a scary environment that they need to get the hell out of and you definitely get that feeling throughout with um, the soldiers on the ground, which this mainly focuses on. But yeah, the stuff with Kenneth Brana, which you know, may not be, like, a powerhouse performance, but, like, all the stuff that they're talking about, for me, it was like, hey, they did their research in depth to see, like, um, you know, just as far as what happened, what calls were made, and, 
so much so that like you know it isn't that exciting it sounds very it sounds very uh much like closely tied to like what uh I don't want to not navy lingo, you know. I I don't know how to put it, but um, I, I it it did feel like it was well researched and it didn't try to be too melodramatic, and I did appreciate that about it. It has great moments. There is palpable tension. Like I said, it's shot beautifully, and the score is great, and the production design is epic in scale, truly. But maybe it was because of my theater going experience or maybe all of ours experience. But when we got into the lobby and we started talking about it, that's all we talked about. I was like, Oh yeah, the score was good. It looked good. The clothing was good. And that's all we really said about it. Like we didn't, I don't want to say it's because you were focused on other things, no, happening, but, but like the, that's happened. That's happened to me. Nestor and, his, ruined it for me. Nestor and his coworker, they didn't see the people on their phones. They had a different vantage point. And they're like, wait, that happened? I was like, yeah, that happened. You didn't see that happen? And they, they just were unaware. And they still, you know, like, they, none of us were raving about it. I don't think anyone's going to rave right. about this movie. Yeah, no, I'm, I, it's, it's not like a masterpiece, but, like, I do think it's very well made and oh, I have yeah, very it's a, little. It's I don't have anything bad to say movie. about it. It's an impressive film, not just because it's made in today's society and today's cinematic, like, uh, just relevancy, or not relevancy, but well, I mean, where cinema that, currently you know, is. It's, it's proof that filmmaking is not dead, which even Valerian is an example of that. It's just, you know, it's just, there's different kinds of filmmaking out there. And it shows that if anything, we live in a fucking awesome time where we should be making the best movies ever because we have every tool at our disposal. It's not a silver dollar for me. It's just a movie. It's not a bad one, but it's just a movie. It's, it's a fine two hours at the cinema, especially if you see it the way it's supposed to be seen, whether that be in 70 millimeter IMAX or IMAX 70. If you see it on a big screen, the better. That's cool. You're going to get your money's worth. But if you see this, you know, on a standard screen or heaven forbid a phone screen, there's not anything here. Like no, it's just I mean, a movie. Is, like Nolan basically made a, a movie that its value after this, I think, will be unless it's uh, revival screenings. Yeah. You know, history classes will show this, and it'll be cool for that. Perhaps, yeah. Which which would be cool in in a in a film, not in a film class, but yeah, in in school. Uh, so, what else did you catch this week? Did you do anything? Watch anything? Buy anything? Eat anything good? I mean, I ate a pizza just before the show. You know, Red Baron nice and cheap and i was fucking hungry because i've been working all day but uh let's see what i see i saw um a ghost story which is david lowry's flick that he made right after pete's dragon in secret and premiered at sundance to rave reviews um really nice small low budget metaphysical movie that um you know i i I don't I can't talk about these for too long because then I feel like I'd be You're spoiling my interpretation yeah. or I just sound like a pretentious asshole talking about it. And but you know, I'm probably going to see it later this year because it's somewhat horror. It's not horror. Well, well, not horror, but it's has to do with okay. the occult. Not really. It's called um, a ghost story. I mean, okay. Has, There's someone yeah, at the bed yeah, yeah. sheet. Uh, I mean, has, it has more to do with time. Um, if anything, so it's interstellar. I got without it. Without trying to sound pretentious about it. I, I feel like it has a lot of conversations on the surface of how we're in a, di- in a different universe and things don't matter. But I think is a far more, um, just with, it doesn't say it through dialogue, but I think just through form and through visual imagery is a, uh, is much more, uh, optimistic than that but yeah no like this was you know this this was an art film that um i saw and i took quite a bit from but you know like every single time i talk about it with people that saw it unless we get in like a very deep discussion then we'll always go back to hey man how about rooney mara and that pie because just so you know there is a scene where for four minutes you're just watching rooney mara eat pie and it's an unbroken take um and which you know (laughs) Well, probably has a lot of um, conversations around it. I looked through Letterboxd and people were like, hey, that pie, though, she ate the shit out of that pie. Or this movie's so fucking pretentious. It's just her eating pie for four minutes. Fuck this movie. I want my money back. Like, just know maybe that, you know, when that happens, you'll you can probably try to appreciate the context of what it's going for a bit better. But, yeah, there are quite a few unbroken takes here. And I do think it works as far as how it tries to stretch out these moments and just capture just the feeling around it and really it is just the mood that i took with me that stayed with me when i was watching and so yeah 
uh, Ghost Story is a silver dollar. Um, I, I would recommend checking it out, especially once it hits Amazon and just watch it in the dark, put on some headphones. You know, I know you'll hate it, Brian, because it's in a ratio that you don't like, which is one by three, three. Yeah, no thanks. And it uses it in some interesting way. But, you know, I love that. I was also at the fact it was, I was at a theater where they actually closed the curtain for that too. So, uh, it was nice how they played it, but, um, Maybe I'll yeah, watch Ghost it on Story, my... one of the. One of the better movies of the year. I'll watch it on my CRT, so it takes up the full ratio. There you go. <laughs> Two other things that I saw um, were comedies where basically my reaction was, yeah, that was funny, and they're both a dime a dozen. It was uh, Mike and Dave Need Wedding Dates, which no one I saw. rented <laughs> because I just needed to like be distracted and kind of laugh at something. And, uh, you know, it's, it's basically that. It's an airplane movie. Um, you know, it came out last summer. I guess it did okay. Uh, what is funny is I guess, uh, you know, it, it has this incredible massage scene with Camille Nanjiani where he plays a, uh, a masseuse and it goes way over the top and yeah, you know, definitely not the same guy, uh, that you see in the big sick, but I'm glad that he made the big sick is not, and it's not just reduced to some cheesy stereotypical no, watch, uh, comedic role no, watch all the time. No, watch fucking, um, his career is... Silicon be- Valley? Uh, yeah, it's because of Silicon Valley, which he's been on for four yeah. seasons now. But no, yeah, most people know him because of that. Most people that probably saw The Big Sick is because of that. Like, that is his claim to fame more so than anything else. Even if he has had Comedy Central shows and he has, like, bit roles in movies such as Mike and Dave New Wedding Days. But I would see it probably just to see uh, Anna Kendrick and... Uh, oh, yeah. Like, uh, and what's her name? Like... Op- Audrey Plaza, Plaza. like o- opposite each other because yeah. they're friends in real life and they probably have really good screen chemistry oh yeah and I mean they are funny like I did laugh uh, you, or I chuckled more so you know like I don't really you know sometimes you just need a comedy to like throw on and just laugh a little bit like mm-hmm. this is one of those comedies where once Comedy Central has it they'll play it on repeat and you'll just watch it because you're bored you know but yeah it's an airplane movie I dug it but um uh, another thing which gets the same exact rating for the same reasons, although it's a slightly better film. Hey, you love um, Aubrey Plaza. You just said it. But I saw you saw. Uh, Little Hours, which is the comedy based on, um, I think, one of the stories in the Decameron. Um, it's a very, it's a small movie that, um, you know, is kind of like uh, Year One, um, which was not a good movie that came out years ago. Definitely not um, a good movie. Yeah, which is a shame. I wanted to see it, but yeah. I guess it didn't turn out well. But no. it's that same idea where, uh, you know, this is set, I think, in the 1100s, takes place at a, uh, at n- not a convent, although, well, or maybe, I guess, I, I don't know, it's been a while since I saw it. Um, you know, there's a bunch of these uh, these nuns there um, in training, and then there is one priest played by John C. Riley, and there's a servant played by Dave Franco, and, you know, they're... It, they're basically speaking modern lingo like you know there's a ton of f-bombs and shit uh the girls like drink wine at one point which is forbidden but you know they they like say shit in a modern way but they're talking about things that are specific to that time it's like you get the joke but it is um it, it is it does set up some funny situations it's it's amusing it's a dime a dozen, you know, I'd, I'd watch it, like, th- this is a definitive, I think, streaming title, because it's, it had a very, very limited release, but, I mean, hey, it's, it's funny, I laughed, um, that's really the best I could say about both of those. Are there any sex jokes, as you know? Oh, plenty of, lots of sex, plenty um, of sex. The things that I watched this week were actually mostly anime outside of the movies, like, I, I, you know how they say like the longer you date someone the more you become them um so i, I have access I it she likes anime yeah, yeah a lot so i uh i have access to her crunchy roll account so i watched one thing on that and i started watching something on netflix the first thing is something that she like recommended like literally right when we first started dating it's called food wars and i was like oh that sounds interesting like is that like iron chef or something and it's not too far off but it's this weird genre of hentai, not hentai, but sorta called ecchi, and it's basically like over sexualized, but like in almost like a uh, a playful way. Like there's not actual sex going on. It's just like busty people like booze bo- dropping and stuff. And it's so, like the concept of this anime, which I've only seen one episode of, but I'm sure I'll keep watching because it's a new one. There's only like two seasons thus far. Is Basically, this kid is, like, a great chef, and he's, like, trying to follow after his dad to actually become a better version of his dad. But, like, that's not what's interesting. What's interesting about the show is these chefs are so good that when they cook meals, 
they're able to imbue like certain feelings and emotions in the people that consume the food. And that is generally, because like I said, it's etchy. It's kind of like Ratatouille. Uh, yes, except because this is anime almost hentai. It's over the top. It's so over the top that usually it's like, I want meat! And then it's like their their tops are like falling off almost. Like you don't see boobage, you don't see like body parts, but it's like literally like they're like steaming with emotion like, they, they have there's this one sequence in the first episode where like uh it, i don't want to like ruin it ruin it but like this woman eats the dish and then like her three like henchmen do and then when they're done eating they're like on the ground like they just all like orgasm together like it was like the weirdest strangest like oh my god like i can't wait for like tyler to listen to this for tainami type of thing so thus far i don't have a review for that one but it seems like a like a silver dollar it's really interesting the one that i will buy is something that i've been aware of for like a very long time and i'm sure you've at least heard the name of is inuyasha uh, i've not no it's like one of the premier animes that crossed over in america it was part of the original tsunami block and cartoon network which consisted of like dragon ball z inuyasha um there was like a couple other shows but those were the two main ones and then later down the road they added like yu yu Hakusho. they added a couple other things and these set this tone for like anime and especially manga becoming a crossover success in america and so i'm familiar with uh rumiko takahashi's works like matter of fact one of the first manga things i ever read is called rama one half it's amazing i might watch the anime sometimes because i have three volumes in paperback there's like 30 of them it's one of those things where you have to dedicate a bookshelf to it like literally um and it's like just really interesting it's about this guy that falls into like a cursed spring in, in feudal japan and now like anytime he gets touched by cold water he becomes a girl and if he gets hit by hot water as a girl he becomes a guy like it's a very interesting like piece of fiction that especially in today's like transnormative society totally makes sense and i'm sure is going to get some well, kind that's of a, that seems like that's a common thing in anime like i told i i talked about your name on here right yeah um but this is this is from like the 80s this is old. Okay. This is old. Yeah, and I, I guess your name does it more in like a narrative way, where it's it's pretty sweet, actually. I, actually, I I swear that movie might really be up your alley. Maybe. So you should definitely oh, ask her about that. Maybe. Uh, but yeah, like I grew up kind of around when I was reading that in in middle school, and even though I'd seen Unuyasha in passing, like I'm sure you've seen it. It's like this guy with a red kimono on, and or like whatever not kimono but yeah like a red dress and he has it looks like cat ears and and fangs but he's actually like a wolf it's hard to explain but anyway real interesting i've seen two well technically three but the third one i was drunk and like slept through um but basically there's this girl kagome who falls backwards through time in a well and wakes up in feudal japan and she's like it, it's it's bizarre. It's hard to explain. It's on Netflix. At least the first two seasons are. You can watch it either dubbed or with subtitles. I highly recommend subtitles because I tried to watch the dub as an experiment. It's horrible. I think that's why on Toonami originally back in the day, like 15 years ago, I couldn't do it because the dubbing is really bad, much <laughs> like all anime. Um, but, yeah, give that one a go if you're listening. I think you guys will like it. It's really fun. Um, just, just like a landmark anime show like it it really did start a lot of the things that contemporary anime does and it does them well and the art's also really good too uh the final thing i'll talk about is i got something very very cute i got me a new nintendo 3ds xl it's yellow and it has pikachu on it uh it's awesome when i saw it i knew i wanted it and i finally got one way after the fact and i only have one game for the sucker and it is something that i'm very excited to have because i wanted the game for a very long time too it's called final fantasy uh it's called what the fuck is called is that theater rhythm final fantasy and it is uh the epitome of fan service it does it has like five songs from each of the first 13 final fantasy mainline stories and so that's uh like like 60 songs roughly uh, and extra ones too and challenge modes and all kinds of stuff and it's like done in chibi form um it's something that could definitely be done on a smartphone i don't know why they haven't done it yet they probably will soon and like i said this is a 3ds have you used one before nope oh uh, no okay so 
I, I'm sure I've talked about in passing. I've used one many a times. This is the first time I've used one at long length. Um, it is the Nintendo system that predates the Nintendo Switch, and it has glassesless 3D. Uh, it kind of sucks because the Netflix and YouTube apps don't take advantage of that, but you can go in the web browser, you can look up 3D photos or go to YouTube.com and look at 3D uh, videos that way through the web browser, and it's really impressive. Like, you can, there's a 3D slider so you can set how far the depth is, both in-game or while, like, online. Uh, the menus are in 3D. Everything's in 3D. Uh, most of the games are, for that matter. Most of them, uh, nowadays, they're just in 2D, which kind of sucks. But yeah, any given moment, I can turn the 3D on. I can be brought further into the world. Like, in, in terms of like, the YouTube videos, there's, like, a very impressive pop-out. And the model that I have, because I have the new one, um, it has great head tracking, where you can move your head left and right and up and down and back and forth. And the 3D is going to stay there. It's going to know what you're doing. And this is technology that they put in a handheld system. It has stereoscopic cameras on the outside, so I can record both videos and photos in 3D and then do playback natively. And it's a test I want to do. I wonder if I can record a 3D video and somehow export that either to Google Cardboard and or uh, PlayStation VR, as I have a feeling that I can. I mean, it wouldn't be uh, 360 or 180, but it would still be in 360, So I, I mean, in 3D. So I have videos and pictures of my cat, you know, that are going to even look better potentially than 4K in the future because I'll be able to relive, you know, how, like, far his tail was from his head or whatever the fuck I want to say. And it, it's just, it, it's real sad that the technology wasn't placed within the Nintendo Switch as well um, because TVs still don't have this. And this handheld proves that for at least a singular viewer... Glassesless 3D is not only possible, but not that cost like uh, defective. Like a new one of these is only two hundred dollars nowadays. Hmm. It, that that's very cheap. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, just as far as like improving that tech. I think VR is probably, or you know, holograms will be there probably before TVs do. Like no, like you, you know, you we'll, can, get, we'll get to the point where TVs are this, no longer necessary. I, I would assume that the screen on this is made by either HTC or Samsung. You know, Nintendo doesn't make their own hardware; they outsource it. And it's good. You know, it's not the highest pixel, like, density or anything. It's not HD. Um, well, it's like 720 maybe. But, you know, it's not the craziest resolution. And when you're doing it in 3D, it's even lesser than. But, no, it's it's really impressive. You've been on the Final Fantasy Rhythm game that I have that I really love thus far. Uh, probably by the sequel for called Curtain Call. Um, no, it's it's really impressive. And, and then probably the best thing about owning this is I just, you know, bought a fanny pack this past week. I have two, actually, but I wear one when I'm not working. And it fits perfectly in it. The thing has, like, a step counter on it, among other things. And I can, like, at any moment, you know, grab, like, my chapstick or a lighter or whatever or my fucking 3DS out of my man purse. That, you like, buy on my so vibe. many things, man. Where do you find the time? No, I'm slowing down now. I need to start selling. Like I said, the the Dollar Reviews uh, store marketplace is going to be opening soon. I have uh, a big amount of clothes, both like beanies. Matter of fact, I have a um, whole bloody affair Kill Bill beanie, which looks awesome. I'm going to sell that probably for $24. Um, I'm, I'm thinking maybe on eBay it might be on Depop. I'm not sure. I, I have T-shirts. I, I, I have uh, some VHS tapes I want to unload, maybe some DVDs. I'm not sure. And yeah, I, I'm going to be start selling those very soon, definitely before my birthday. So hopefully in the next week or two, the marketplace is going to be up. And uh, the next time I do the, the Goodwill finds, perhaps you'll hear about something you want. You can check it out on whatever the website ends up being or whatever the URL is. I'll share it whenever that's ready. And you can actually buy it from the horse's mouth. You can, you can take it home or I'll send it home for you. Thanks for listening. We hope it's been a pleasure. We're also on Debt to Cinema, where one or both of us crosses a title off our list of shame. You can find all of our content at dollarreviews.net. Follow us on Twitter or like us on Facebook at Dollar Reviews. We're available on iTunes, YouTube, TuneIn, Stitcher, and constantly looking to expand to other platforms. If you listen somewhere we're currently not available, you'd like to contribute some talking points, send a Debt to Cinema request, or if you just want to laugh at us, you can do so by reaching out to us on social media or send an email to brian at dollarreviews.net. Or you can email me as well, steve at dollarreviews.net. You can follow me personally on Twitter at Brian Gillis. That's B-R-Y-O-N-G-I-L-L-I-S. And now you know how to spell 
or email too, and also under the same name on the Love You site letterbox, which acts as my film diary, where I rate films I'm watching, write the occasional review, and even sometimes compile lists. You can also find me on Twitter at S underscore MTX, and also follow my film diary at letterbox under the same name, where I log everything I watch, and sometimes write brief reviews. That's it for this week. Until next time, keep the change.